Hey, Reluctant Preppers, you could have been watching this video the moment it came out. By going to healingyourself.life and subscribing to our new sister channel, Healing Yourself. See you there. Healingyourself.life provides information for awareness, educational, and support purposes only and does not diagnose or prescribe treatment for any medical condition. Viewers are encouraged to do their own due diligence and consult with their own medical caregivers before making personal treatment decisions. Welcome back to HealingYourself.life. We are back with our off-grid Dr. Jane Nielsen, MD. He is a 13-year veteran of FDA research. He's been in private practice for 42 years. 42 years. He's got. He's carved out a reputation as a pioneer in integrative uh, work as well as affordable health care. And he tends to be a bit of a maverick. He's got a uh, Christian mission and survival compound in Haiti, and he's here to talk with us today about thyroid. Why is it so important for health? And we're gonna look primarily at hypothyroidism or low thyroid function, and also take a brief look at hyperthyroidism, but uh, really try to uncover what is the cause of this? Why is it so important? And what are the uh, healing options that are the best for the individual? Uh, Dr. Nielsen, thank you as always for joining us here on healingyourself.life. Good to be here. So if we could maybe take a first uh, touch at why are we approaching you about thyroidism, uh, hypothyroidism, you know, in a, in a nutshell, what's your exposure to it? And then we can talk, start getting into what are the causes of this? What, what, why, why does this thing go off the rail? Sometimes? Why well, it it's gone off the rail for some very interesting reasons. Um, my father was a pioneer in thyroid management as a family doctor as well. So this is not a new problem. And the interesting fact is, is the first pharmaceutical manufacturer ever to have a rep, a pharmaceutical rep, was um, Synthroid. And when Synthroid came out, T3 Armour Thyroid had already been on the market since the 1920s. It and, and Premarin, pregnant horse urine, are the two oldest hormones available because they were both made from animals and you didn't have to know how to synthesize. And so Armour already had 100% of the market and Synthroid came out and they needed to be able to prove to doctors that they needed to move on into the space age. And so these guys showed up, PhDs in biochemistry or pharmacology with tape on their glasses and a pocket liner, true geeks, okay? Very, very well educated and their job was to explain to doctors that T4 makes more sense than T3 because um, this is pure, we know the dose, there's no problem, you know, dose to dose variability, all of the problems that we always had with Armour Thyroid. And my father sucked that up with everybody else and went out and changed all of his patients in 1963, 1964 over to Synthroid. And half the patients came back and said, I want to go back on my Armour, I felt better. And that resulted in a war. That resulted in Boots Pharmaceutical Flint, whatever you want to call, as David Crosby said, you know, who are these men and on what street do they live? Those people who changed the names of their companies all went out and started doing beat downs on docs who didn't write 100% Synthroid. And this went on to be true really throughout almost all of my father's career. He got brought before the state medical board because he refused to stop writing Armour Thyroid. Um, he was a member of the state medical board. He was the District 5 representative of the state medical board prior to that. None of that counted. They still came after him for that. And there was a point by about 1975, 1976, where you couldn't get Armour Thyroid and the company actually started carrying a very short list of doctors in the country that would write it. And so this happened at the same time as EDTA cured heart disease and cortisone and birth control pills cause um, candida. And as a result, the yeast, the lupus, the thyroid and the chelation created alternative medicine. That's how alternative medicine doctors came out. That's why they were called alternative, is because they were doing things that traditional docs would not recognize, and the big alternative was T3 thyroid. So this is the background of how we've arrived at this situation where if you go into an endocrinologist, 
you're only going to get one test, TSH. If you are abnormal, and God help you that an endocrinologist will treat you if your TSH is abnormal, they tend to really be very slow to treat, and I'll show you research on that today, then you're only going to get Synthroid. And if you come in talking about Westroid, Naturethroid, Armor, any of the T3 products, you're going to get a beat down from your doctor. And that's created a countercultural belief. Now, it's interesting because that has resulted in T3 thyroid being called natural thyroid. And I, I don't really get that discussion. And I've said this to many, many patients over 42 years. We use bioidentical estrogen, estriol, estradiol, estrone, bioidentical progesterone. It's made from the Mexican yam, and a chemist turns it into exactly bioidentical human hormones. And we don't believe in Premarin, which is just dehydrated pregnant horse piss, okay? We don't call conjugated estrogens Premarin natural estrogen, okay? But when we come to this argument, because it's so full of vim and vigor, Synthroid is called synthetic thyroid, mm -hmm. Synthroid, even though it's bioidentical. And meanwhile, we call Armour Thyroid natural, even though it's made from pig. I don't get it. I don't go in for any of that. I say, you know, if your lab says you need T3, you need T3. If your lab says you need T4, you need T4. I don't get into the politics. I give people what the lab and their clinical response says they should have. I think that's how thyroid should be practiced. I've done it for 40 years, and it's made me good at it. Could you uh, give people a little bit of an understanding why the thyroid is so important for the human body and human health? Well, the issue about thyroid is that, as we've talked about in other shows, all hormones are on switches to function. Cortisone's anti-inflammatory, epinephrine is fight or flight, estrogen makes female, testosterone's in both sexes and causes repair, progesterone is anti-cancer, DHEA is anti-cancer and adrenal stabilizing. T3 is the on switch for all function. If you don't own it, you've shut yourself off and you're idling. If you're idling, you're not repairing and you're not detoxifying. Hmm. That's why you become edematous and your skin peels off and your hair becomes brittle. Nothing is working right. It's very important to realize that the cycle of how this works is that the pituitary makes TRF that then makes TSH from the pituitary that then tells the thyroid to make T4, which goes back out into the blood, back to the thyroid, gland and is converted to T3 where this chart doesn't show that it goes out to the cell and it turns into the active form T2. No one talks about T2 because you can't measure T2. You would have to grind. You'd have to do tissue biopsy and grind cells up to find T2. Wow. But T4 has a very limited role in the human body. It wakes up the cortex of the brain. It's a bronchodilator. It's irritating to the heart and causes arrhythmias and it causes the feedback loop to TSH. Too bad T3 doesn't cause the feedback loop to TSH. We would be healthier for it, but that's just the design, okay? T3 does everything else in the human body, but again, remember, T3 doesn't do anything until it turns into T2. And all that thyroid is, is the threonine amino acid with four iodines and when you, that's T4, drop one, T2, T3, drop two, T2. And then T2 is reprocessed in the thyroid gland to T3 and T4 and re-released. Okay. Uh, why the thyroid is brought back to the thyroid gland to be processed twice? Way past my pay scale. As a result, today, we have all of these products for thyroid replacement. These are the big two, Armour and Synthroid. And if you notice... All of the doses mostly can be broken in half to make even other doses, like the 88 over here could be a 44. And so there are lots, the 75 could be a 37.5, mm -hmm. okay? And the armor is also in a variety of doses. What does that tell us? That really tells us that there isn't one size fits all. The endocrinologists believe 50 micrograms fix everything. The average patient who comes in to me and says they're doing poorly usually reports they're taking 50 or 75 micrograms of Synthroid alone. Mm -hmm. Well, if 
Synthroid is converted to T3 in the thyroid gland and the thyroid gland isn't working, how's the synthroid going to get converted? If you've had your thyroid gland removed, as I did in 1981 for thyroid cancer, which is one of the reasons I'm interested in thyroid, is I got really terrible care from my doctor and it motivated me to figure it out myself. You bet. The, if people who have no thyroid gland never can take Synthroid alone. Mm -hmm. sure. It won't convert. Right. Say that to an endocrinologist. They don't know that. They just keep giving more and more and more. Well, the T4 will suppress the TSH. It just won't turn into T3. So the vast majority of patients who contact me and say, can you please work on my thyroid? I gave up on my endocrinologist will be on T4 Synthroid. They will have a suppressed TSH. And when you do their timed lab, it's going to be below normal. And those people need to be put on T3 called subclinical hypothyroidism or Wilson syndrome. Okay. The, um, there are a lot of variables that are going on in that. And the things that, that, here's an article that was in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this guy says, a substantial minority of hypothyroid patients on therapy say they do not feel well as they would like to unless they take 50 micrograms more of T4 per day than the dose needed to fix the TSH. Okay, These articles just keep coming. TSH is inadequate for monitoring. TS range is not universally applicable. This is all out of the endocrine literature. Experts suggest that we change the range for TSH. And you go to your endocrinologist or your family doctor, they don't even do thyroid levels. They do pituitary levels. They assume the pituitary gland is working. 20% of people in America today due to EMF, toxins, etc., have pituitary tumors that are benign. Those pituitaries are not going to correctly report TSH. Meanwhile, our favorite thing to beat up on, bottled water, the styrenes suppress conversion of TSH. About, I love this, about once every two years in my practice, I have a young girl who comes into my office and she starts her periods and she's been having her periods for two years and all of a sudden her periods stop. And I go do lab. And she has no estrogen, no progesterone, yet her FSH is not elevated. Her T3 and T4 are low, yet her TSH is not elevated, and she has a low DHEA. And I go, do you drink bottled water? Yeah, 20 a day. Yeah, sure. I'm very well hydrated. Right, right. Okay. And how much do you use a cell phone? And they go, not much. And mom goes, 14 hours a day. And I go, okay you've got a pituitary problem. Let's get an MRI. And I get an MRI and the pituitary has no tumors. It's swollen. And I go, found the problem, get a Bluetooth, get off the cell phone, no screen usage, only talking, eliminate the bottled water. 14 days later, the period starts. Four weeks later, I do new lab. All the labs normal. Four weeks later, I go back, do a new MRI. It's normal. Hello, I'm seeing one of these every couple years. I'm a family doc. What would happen if an endocrinologist started to integrate those kind, of, that kind of thinking? So you this is a toxicology issue. You've described that's startling. These lifestyle patterns that are so prevalent uh, can it can influence us in ways that people never ever have been warned about. Can you remind us what kind of presenting symptoms people notice? You mentioned here her her periods were missing. You mentioned before people might have hair breaking or falling out. Are there other typical symptoms that people would that think suspect and they should ask their doctor about thyroid? Very nice little chart, okay? A 50-year-old textbook I used in medical school and just love it called the Netter series. Weight gain, edema, brittle hair, um, scaling of skin, slow thought, low temperature, cold, low blood pressure, heavy periods, elevated cholesterol and low blood you're pressure, shutting down the blood pressure could be evidenced by people who feel faint when they stand up that kind of thing. yeah 
or mm -hmm. cold, their fingers are cold all the time. Yeah, primarily the biggest symptom of hypothyroidism is fatigue, especially once you have incorrect therapy, late day fatigue, because now you're getting something in the morning, it's not making it all day. People who are undertreated tend to at least get something out of their penny ante dose and then they fall apart again. So late day fatigue is a sign of a number of thyroid factors that I have to deal with in my practice. Low thyroid function is called properly hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism and high thyroid function is hyperthyroidism. Can you is there any difference between hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's disease? Well Hashimoto's disease is an autoimmune disorder of unknown cause, although we will hit that in our closing of this discussion, in which the thyroid gland is inflamed and enlarged and has antibodies against itself. And Hashimoto's is going to go through a hyperthyroid phase where it makes too much thyroid, then burn out the thyroid and become normal which is when the endocrinologist will say, thank heavens that's over and head right into hypothyroidism. Okay, so you got the full gamut. Okay, and the same thing's true of Graves' disease. You're going to burn out your thyroid, and if you don't die from being real hyperthyroid, you're eventually going to lose your thyroid. So many, many people who are hypothyroid, if you dig into their history, you can find a period of tremor, hot, sweating, weight loss, you know, rapid hair growth, lovely skin. I had a secretary who worked for me who had severe Graves disease and she would not treat it because she loved how she felt. She was thin, energetic, and her hair was beautiful and her skin looked lovely. And I went, you're dying, Sarah. And she said, I don't care, I like this disease. And she went to bed and died one night, 27 years old. Oh my God. Now, hyperthyroidism is just like being on amphetamines. It's just, you feel wonderful. Causes, briefly before we get to treatment, uh, so causes hopefully will imply prevention. Uh, you talk about don't bring bottled water, don't be holding a cell phone up to your head, other other things that people can do. And you've said this has been around for a long time. This has been around, been around before bottled water or cell phones, if your dad was dealing with it back sure. in. So. Well, the big cause is, and I had some research on this, and I tried to dig it up, and I couldn't find it. But um, you've skipped into the end of my thing. Here we go. It's a bunch of things really quickly to go through cause. The number one cause of hypothyroidism is multiple pregnancy. Hypothyroidism in nuns is relatively uncommon. You had me going on that when you said um, your hair is lush, the skin looks great, because I was thinking, my wife, we've had five children, right. and in pregnancy, oh wow, yeah. um, you know, she just bl bloomed and blossomed. Well, of course, she's full estrogen and progesterone, which okay. helps too. Okay, all but right. But your metabolism is increased because you've got to feed this baby. All right, thing, okay. okay. Um, and so, the, you know, there are a lot of variables in that. Here's a new one that was just published two weeks ago, that selenium reverses Hashimoto's. Wow. Which was interesting. Here is an article that was published a few years ago showing that fluoride causes Hashimoto's. Of course, we're putting that in all of our water. Not to mention uh, tooth rinse uh, that you can buy and do it right. yourself as well. Here's one. Artificial sweeteners cause Hashimoto's. Okay. Um, th this is an issue. You see a lot of people who their thyroid gets messed up, so they decide to load a lot of iodin. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of that. It screws more people up than it fixes. Mm -hmm. I tell people you really want to try other things. Here's one that screws up the baby. Okay. Here we go. Here's published research that polyvinyl chlorides, PVCs, and PFCs cause hypothyroidism and cancer. So the okay. new uh, low cost. A uh, high-speed way of building houses is to use plastic tubing for all the water pipes in the house instead of copper pipes yeah, or right. whatever. So, pet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pet tubing. Yeah, yeah, bad idea. All right. We went from lead pipes to, to copper, copper yeah. to PVC and now to PET. And we've gone all the way back full cycle. We would have been better off to stay back at copper. It's still the right way to plumb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from a prevention standpoint is reducing exposure to all of those things that you just mentioned. Um, if you've already got the symptoms that you mentioned of low thyroid, uh, you recommend people do what in terms of considering testing and then determining, okay, well, of course, well, the treatment. Your primary testing is that you want to check all your hormones. 
first of all. So anytime anybody comes to me for thyroid, I'm going to check estrogen, progesterone, DHEA sulfate, testosterone. Um, I'm going to check parathyroid hormone if I have a reason to for bone metabolism because it is in the back of the thyroid gland and um, therefore is um, it can be coexistent, especially in malignancy. And then I'm going to check a free T3 and a free T4. And then I'm going to go into my pituitary hormones, TSH for thyroid, ACTH for cortisol, PTH for parathyroid, LH or FSH for the sex organs, and make sure that the entire endocrine system is working. Plus, you have simpler things to do. Take your temperature, basal thermometer, that pregnancy preparation thermometer that only does the narrow range, yeah. and you do that before you get out of bed and before you see. So you have to shake the thermometer down the night before. You put it under your tongue and you record it before you become active. That's called a basal temperature. People who are hypothyroid are commonly best titrated to the correct thyroid dose by fixing their basal temperature, not their lab. And sometimes you'll see patients who all their thyroid tests are in the middle of normal. Well, the problem is, is if normal thyroid is 0.8 to 1.8, don't we need to know whether or not when I was healthy and before I was pregnant, I was 1.7 or 0.81? Because if I was 1.7 and now I'm 1.1, I'm hypothyroid. Mm -hmm. But if I was 0.85 and now I'm 1.1, I'm hyperthyroid. And so we never encourage people to do baseline labs when they're healthy. I commonly do ah, that to patients. I see your have, point. So the reference range is it's so wide. It's very not, wide. It's not individual. It's, just, it's some kind of an average. Right. And so individuals. if this person has low temperature and you give them thyroid and they're clinically improved and their temperature improves, that's your definition that you successfully treated them, okay. not what their TSH or their labs are. The second problem you run into, other than the fact that doctors only do TSHs, is if they do by some miracle actually end up doing thyroid levels. It's more common for family docs to do thyroid levels than endocrinologists. But if they do manage to do it, they'll only do a T4. If by some miracle they do a T3, they'll make them random. So the patient will take their thyroid in the morning and one time they'll go into the lab an hour later. Oh, right. And the next time it's after work and they go at five, well, every time that they go in at nine in the morning, their level will be high so the doctor will lower it. And then the next time they'll go in, they'll go in at five in the evening and it'll be really low so they'll take it up. And as patients come in and they say, my doctor can't find a dose. And I go, no, he can't find a time of day to test. I make all of my patients do all of their endocrine tests six hours after they take their dose. And so I don't even really care when they get up. I just make it 2 p.m. I just want it to be consistent. And in doing that, you'd be surprised. My thyroid levels in a patient sometimes will be within 5% of each other over years because I'm not wandering all over. This is what your thyroid levels, T3 and T4, do over one day. Okay? And so Endocrinologists say, oh, I'll see you in six months. It takes six months for my thyroid level to become adjusted. Nah, family physicians, the American Academy of Family Practice did research. It takes 10 days. They're just getting rid of you. They don't want it. They don't want to treat you. They don't want you to have anything. So if they can at least delay your care for a few years, it's like some kind of moral victory to them. I don't understand endocrinologists. I don't know why they went into the field when they're not interested in the base material. And then you've got this issue of interaction. Here's research showing that cortisol, growth hormone, progesterone, and T3 are all interrelated. Here's one that's going into the role of cortisol. And so if you're having a really stressful day and you go to the lab for your thyroid, have a nice day. It's not going to be accurate. Um, here's one on DHEA. The only one I could ever find was an effect in rats. Okay, so my rats are getting better care than I am. Okay, um, and then you've got all of these issues. If you're taking Prilosec or Zantac or one of the acid suppressors, your thyroid's not going to absorb. Here's the one about the 10 days versus six months. Here's a research that proved that titrating up your thyroid slowly doesn't work. I can fix people's thyroid in three or four weeks. Sure, I need to go back in six, eight weeks and do one more lab and make sure that it didn't change. This is the problem. 
It is estimated by the American Academy of Family Practice that 30% of all women that have had two pregnancies are hypothyroid. Tell that to an endocrinologist. It's very familial, the family history of hypothyroidism. Yeah. I tell yeah. people that menstrual history, menopause history, hypothyroidism and gallbladder are the things that are the most inherited. We're all out trying to inherit breast cancer. I don't think it's very heritable. A lot of people come in and they say, I want to get off my thyroid. And I go, so you're on thyroid and now the thyroid is suppressing your thyroid. So your thyroid is dissolving because you're taking thyroid replacement and now you want to stop. You know, I agree with this research. You go on thyroid, you're on it for life. That's the reason why I don't start it injudiciously okay um, then you get into this where does this take you thyroid in either direction higher or lower increases your risk of heart disease but if you fix it your heart goes back to normal okay here's a study that showed that all causes of mild hypothyroidism increased all causes of mortality in the hmm. human body. People die more when their thyroid's in the lower half. There's the one on family history, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, there's congestive heart failure, okay? And interestingly, they went out and tried to find risk factors because your endocrinologist will say, don't take too much thyroid because it'll cause osteoporosis. They went out and did research backwards looking for the causes of osteoporosis and found out that T3 low caused osteoporosis, which is exactly my experience. Okay. And of course, everybody's out there taking a statin and low, low thyroid causes high cholesterol. It's a mess. Then you get into the next problem. You got patients come in, they're on Synthroid. And I do my lab and their T4's up, their TSH is down and their T3 is terrible. So I can go ahead and take them off of T4 and put them on only T3. And then I get T3's okay, T4's down, and the TSH is terrible. Probably a third of the time. And so there are people who say, well, I don't want to take T4. It's made by a pharmaceutical manufacturer. I go, oh, you want to take thyroid that's made by a hot dog manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> Armor, that's where it came from. Okay, I, I don't care who makes it. It's all generic now. It's all garbage. You're much better off on brand name Synthroid. It's definitely better. Okay, but it's and there's coupons online. You can get it for ten dollars a month with a coupon. Get brand name. I, I don't care about any of that. I don't do cost of healthcare stuff that much when it comes to a primary. You're going to be really sick if you don't fix this. I say you fix it right. Once we get you fixed, we can try switching over to generic and see if you miss it, but fix it right the first time. Most men pretty much can be fixed with Synthroid. They don't need T3 as often, and they almost never need to take another dose later in the day. But women, probably 40 to 50% of the women in my practice need both T4 and T3. And half of those women, 20%, need to take another half a dose at noon to one o'clock or they won't make it to bedtime. You'll never see an endocrinologist do that. And, but if you ask patients to journal their fatigue throughout the entire day, okay, you, you, you're going to pick these people up and they'll, they'll just flag out and fall apart at four o'clock. In know, addition to fatigue, does the sensation of being cold is also a symptom they should... All of the watch. symptoms will come back, but yeah. most people it's easiest to monitor fatigue because okay. it's the global symptom. Now we have another subset of people. I've done all my work. I got my T3 and T4 fixed, and the patient is doing one of two things. They're not completely f fixed on their fatigue or their TSH is not correcting. Okay, what's going on? Well, remember, we've got that T2 that we can't measure. Right. And so if you go out and take the supplement Thyrostim, okay, which is made by Biotics and can be purchased over the counter, okay, on, you can buy it online, okay, the rubidium that's in Thyrostim is the trace mineral that expedites the conversion of T4 to T3 and T3 to T2. I took Synthroid and Armor, Westroid is what I take, or Naturethroid, they're all relatively the same. We won't get into that, minor differences. 
from the time of my thyroid cancer, once I got myself regulated and realized I needed both of them, I was fine. And all of a sudden, about four years ago, my TSH went up, my T4 went up, my T3 went up. And I went, what the heck's going on? I went, I'm not converting. And so artificial thyroid replacement is depleting your rubidium. And I went on thyrostim and by 11 o'clock the day I took my first two thyrostim, I was fine. Went back, checked my life two weeks later, went right back to normal. Now I'm on thyrostim. And so all of these variables are out there that are affecting each other. And as we started out, we said, you know, I, I'm not going to fix somebody's thyroid if they have PMS. I'm going to give them progesterone, fix their PMS, retest their thyroid. Probably 20% of them end up going back to normal. I'm not going to fix somebody who's menopausal. I'm going to fix their estrogen, progesterone, DHEA. About 30% of the time, those people go back to normal thyroid function. Thyroid should be the last thing that you fix because it's frequently secondary to everything else. Cortisol is the same way. If you're missing a uh, uh, Addison's disease, mild Addison's disease with mild hypoadrenalism and they don't have cortisone, their natural endogenous cortisone, all your other stuff will all be off. And you go in and give those patients a little bit of adrenal support. It doesn't even have to be cortisone. You can give them ashwagandha and a bunch of the herbs that help adrenal support all of a sudden the thyroid stabilizes. And so this concept, you go into an endocrinologist and you're diabetic and you say, hey doc, how's my thyroid? They go, that's another visit. I don't do two, th two organs at one time. I don't not do all the organs at one. You know, I do them all at the same time. I, I couldn't imagine that answer. Oh no, I want to get the blinders on and get as narrow as possible. And this is why the endocrinologists are struggling with hypothyroidism. You did mention that it affects women more than men? Yes, because of pregnancy. When men get hypothyroidism, they're usually going to have had thyroiditis or they're going to have had a severe virus that wiped out their thyroid. And the onset of their disease will usually be when they're younger. You won't see a man develop hypothyroidism at 50 or 60. They usually are being diagnosed by 20, 25, 30. And it's not nearly as common or they had thyroid cancer and had their thyroid removed. You also mentioned uh, hyperthyroidism in passing that that can actually be, for example, with Hashimoto's, you can actually go through a phase where it actually overtaxes your thyroid and then it, your thyroid ends up underperforming after, Correct. afterwards. And that's, that's, here's Netter's other famous uh, diagram. Tremors, hot, sweating, weight loss, absent periods, beautiful hair, lovely skin, heart arrhythmias and palpitations, muscle loss, you know, it's a, you know, and, and the interesting thing is, like I said, sure, you may not be able to sleep at night, you may be have palpitations, but boy, are you getting a lot done at work. Ah. It's like being on amphetamines, except for you don't get a use to them the way you would amphetamines, you know, and so, which is why my secretary decided to kill herself with it, because she just loved how she felt. But there are people who feel very bad when they're hyperthyroid because they're having panic, anxiety. Your cortisols are just revving. You're just, your adrenaline is high. Yeah, you drink a cup of coffee and your heart rate goes up and you get out palpitations. That's a very difficult problem to treat. Traditional endocrinologists will offer you tapazole, methimazole. These are drugs that poison the thyroid gland and turn it off. They work quite well. Unfortunately, they cause liver cancer and people are kind of getting away from them. So the next thing they offer you is let's let you be hyperthyroid and let's block your adrenaline with Inderol or Corgard. And so you're just staying sick, but you feel better. When that fails, they go, okay, let's give you radioactive iodine. And if we give you the right dose, we'll knock you back down to normal by half killing your thyroid. What do you think a half killed thyroid is going to do in five years? It's going to die because it's like trying to hit a fly with a sledgehammer and knock it unconscious instead of killing it. You're not going to make it. You can't calculate that. And, and you know, when they gave me my radioactive iodine for my thyroid cancer, they wiped out my testosterone. 
You know, these things hit all the endocrine organs. They're like chemotherapy. They just wipe out the endocrine tree. Another, there's another cause of all of these hypothyroidism. Very, very common for patients in chemotherapy to develop fatigue. Yeah. And it's because it wiped out their thyroid. Ah. And the oncologists are not looking. Okay. Literature's full of the, the endocrine toxicities of chemotherapy. And there are a lot of drugs, you know, the, all of the bipolar drugs, they all cause hypothyroidism, Tegretol and lithium and et cetera. Um, you know, there's a lot of toxic drugs that hit the thyroid. So you've provided a lot of insights and information. If people want to seek out a doctor who, like yourself, does more of an integrative approach, any tips on how people can find one? Yeah, well, you want to find a good integrative physician who's doing a lot of bioidentical hormone replacement. A guy who's doing bioidentical hormones is going to be doing correct thyroid. And this gets back to what you told us in the last interview about sex hormones. Go talk to a compounding pharmacist. Go talk to a compounding and pharmacist and ask for the best doc. Okay. Yep. That's how you find because them wherever you are. Because we to notice a pattern of when we do interviews with you that people have a a sincere need and they, they say I'm, I don't know where to start I don't know they, where to go they ask for your address and you can't serve the whole world so right. so this helps give them a pointer where they can find right. someone closer to them right any other closing thoughts about uh, hypothyroidism hyperthyroidism Hashimoto's prevention uh, healing uh, is healing of Hashimoto's different from just just replacing your thyroid levels like this well when you give thyroid to Hashimoto's, once it goes hypothyroid, yes. that will rest the thyroid and make it get smaller. We haven't talked about goiter, enlargement of the thyroid. Thyroid gland's trying to keep up and it can't make it, so it makes itself bigger and chokes you off. and You get a big neck mass. We didn't talk about that. Um, that goiter would go away when you give thyroid replacement. But about the only thing that we saw in there that was really nutritionally stabilizing Hashimoto's was selenium. And taking selenium seems to to turn that down, um, but mostly that's about um, if you know my management. Interestingly, we didn't talk about my management of hyperthyroidism. Everybody wants to give what I call total body therapy. I'm gonna take this drug for my thyroid and it's still going to treat my left thumb because it goes everywhere. I compound with custom compounding pharmacies. Uh, topical lithium and put a microscopic dose or take that tapazole that causes liver cancer and give a hundredth of a dose right on the thyroid gland through the skin. Works like a charm. And so you can get rid of 95% of the dose of your tapazole and get out of your hyperthyroidism until it turns itself off. You, know, you can take oral lithium in very small doses. If you were bipolar, your lithium dose might be um, you know, 30, 40 milligrams three times a day. Five milligrams three times a day will turn hyperthyroidism on. Done it many times. Works very well. You can just titrate it right back when it starts doing better. There are a lot of good tricks. And you know, everybody looks at the docs to the answers. I got to tell you, my compounding pharmacist knows as much medicine as I do. He's a scary smart guy. You know, I always tell people, you know, most of my patients, once they go to their compounding pharmacist for their compounds, switch all their prescriptions over there because the compounding pharmacist spends so much more time with you, educating you and thinking about everything. Regular pharmacists are pill counters. You've seen their pace. They're all frantic back there behind their counters, printing labels and stacking up thousands of bags and trying to make sure they get the right name. You walk into your compounding pharmacist and they're out talking to you about how are the kids and, you know, they may have just done something for your dog. How's Woofy? Okay. You know, the vets are sending a lot of stuff into the compounders. It's a different world. And I tell people, you know, even if you don't need compounds, Think about trying a compound pharmacist as your pharmacist. They're better clinicians. Simplest things we've heard about today are kick the bottled water habit, don't be holding cell phones to your head, and... Uh, have check, your lab timed. Have your lab. Yeah, do your lab at the same time of day. Yeah, taken, and, to get and do all the labs, T3, the T4, labs. TSH, and check your other hormones. That if, if every doctor just learned those three things, there'd be a lot better thyroid care in America. A lot of the stuff you've talked about with us is just, at its base, common sense and can save so much cost and so much heartache on people yeah. rather than chasing chasing after shadows and, and going through, you know, just 
uh, unhelpful uh, uh, care that just drags on and drags on. I couldn't tell you how many times in 42 years that I put somebody on thyroid that an endocrinologist said was didn't need it and the patient came back and then their diet worked and they became non-diabetic and then their blood pressure came down and they didn't need their blood pressure meds and you get done and the only thing you're doing is fixing their thyroid and when they came into you they were on something for their cholesterol and something for their blood pressure and etc and you know the problem with hypothyroidism is it makes doctors treat a lot of symptoms and that's just sad yeah as with other things we've talked about, including uh, Lyme and Candida, that can have multi symptoms and can have you chasing your tail if you're not if you're not addressing the root cause. Well, we've been talking with our off grid doctor Jane Nielsen, an integrative uh, doctor who practices in Northwest Ohio, and uh, this time about hypo and hyperthyroidism. Doctor Nielsen, thank you as always for joining us here on Healing Yourself Life. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me.